welcome to another edition of Listen Up a Minute. I'm your co-host John Dahl along with my other co-host Dr. Burt Pope Matthews and we have a good guest with us today, a gentleman who we would say is a renaissance man but he simply wants to be known as a golf and a poet and put it together, golf poet too. That's right. Mr. Carl Matthews. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Thank you. I'm wonderful, John. Thank you for having me. Good to have you. Yeah. Yes, and we are just very excited because this is a game that we want all children to be aware of and as well as adults how this game actually works. People see others playing golf and, and they may have family members who play golf, but we just want to learn about the ins and outs of golf. So we're just very glad to have you here. Thank you very so glad. much. So, how did you get introduced to the game, Carl? Well, if we want to go all the way back to a young kid, 12 years old, mm -hmm. I used to spend some of my summers at my grandfather's, which was adjacent to Lee Park Golf Course, which is just outside of Petersburg, Virginia. And uh, one of these bored afternoons, I wandered down to the golf course and, uh, you know, asked the people if they needed a caddy. So, you know. That's how it all started for me. Yeah. Okay. And how old were you then? Twelve years old. Twelve. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. And so th was there a particular person who introduced you to the game? Or did you just, sounds like you stood back and watched. But did someone excite you? Did, what, what, what did it for you that you wanted to take it as far as you have? Just the challenge of it. Mm -hmm. And also, too, we were like Seventh-day Adventists. And we were not allowed to play other sports in school and stuff. Okay. So uh, I kind of backed into golf and it just developed a real passion for it. And we would imitate uh, golfers, you know, like we watched go different golfers on TV and mm -hmm. we'd emulate their golf swings. And we started out uh, at Lee Park, they had, had uh, a field probably about 80 yards long. Mm -hmm. And we would have little rounds you know, looks, you know, we call them our golf clubs in, but right. we didn't have golf clubs. We had round sticks and had, you know, balls that we may have found, and we'd have a hold here and a hold up here, and we'd be betting money until we got a caddy job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and betting I, money. I found, that was I found, fun. I found my first club, first golf club, which was a uh, seven iron, J.C. Higgins seven iron, oh, wow. up in a tree. What? And in a tree. I, I, yes, and I started, started playing, and I, I fell in love with it. And uh, even when I, I broke my collarbone at, at uh, 12 years old as well. And I remember being out there pr playing one-handed, one-handed. Wow. And just got hooked on it. So you were determined. And like I say, you know, uh, if I could have played football, I would have mm -hmm. probably never played golf. Right, right. Okay. All right. But it seems like it was meant for you to play golf. No doubt. And you know it takes us a step further. My nickname, even long before I played golf, is T. <laughs> oh, interesting. Long before I played golf, it's T. And I don't know where it came from. Interesting. You, know, you mentioned you watched at 12 years old, and for the longest time, outside of the four or five black golfers that people knew about or know about before Tiger Woods, mm -hmm. I didn't think black folk played golf. That's right. But I found out that I have some cousins and some mm -hmm. friends that are older than I am that's been playing golf for years. Mm -hmm. And they all love it. And they say the same thing. Once you get out there and you start chasing that little white ball around, you get hooked <laughs> yeah. because it's so challenging. One day you can play like the king of the world, mm -hmm. and the next day, it's like you don't even know what the concept is. That's how challenging the game is. Yeah, absolutely. And I always wondered, when I was in high school, our basketball coach used to take the basketball players out to Keeney Park in Hartford, Connecticut, and play golf almost every Saturday. Mm. And we couldn't figure out to save our lives, why would the basketball players be playing golf? And then one day, a couple of cheerleaders asked the coach, and he talked about the discipline, the skill, how you had to depend on yourself, and those were the reasons that our basketball players spent Saturday mornings playing golf. 
So just interesting. So okay, let's learn some more about this man and, and what's going on. Well, um, high school now, Coach Peel. I owe him a great deal mm -hmm. of uh, gratitude because uh, my cousins and I, mm -hmm. Stanley Williams, Bert Oliver, and uh, George Foreman played, and another guy, Bobby Lundy. We started the first golf team at Peabody High School in 1962-63. Wow. Wow. And Coach Peel took us up to uh, Washington, D.C., and we played East Potomac. I shoot 77, and the closest guy to me was 85. So, oh. you know, we got trophies and everything for that, yeah. And I awesome. thank God for, for Coach Peel because yeah. if, if they didn't start that golf team, I probably would have dropped out of high school because I really didn't. I, I'm, I wasn't a good student. Mm -hmm. uh, I was into sports, right. and golf was, you know, like the thing that I loved more than anything. You know? And then you became a great student of the game, which helped in well, other areas, correct? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Because, you know, the, the uh, networking opportunities you get in this golf arena mm -hmm. is second to none. Mm -hmm. And now you got a lot of uh, your high-profile athletes playing, Steph Curry, Snoop Dogg, uh, Charles Barkley even got Shaq playing, uh, just on and on and on. And, and I'm telling you, it's people need to realize uh, that it's a multi-billion-dollar industry, mm. and a lot of deals are being cut on the golf course. Oh yes. And our people need to wake up and see what time it is. Okay. okay. We used to hear about that a lot. Some of the best deals are made on golf courses, mm -hmm. and I used to think, well, I don't play golf. I'm not interested. I'm not good at it. So, how do I get to be a part of that deal? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I won't be a deal maker. I won't be included because I'm not on a golf course. Never thought about being a caddy, mm -hmm. like you did. It, but see, the thing is, is if you're not in that arena, right? When those deals are being made, you're not at the table. Right. So you don't get a piece of that pie. Mm -hmm. My nephew used to come to me sometimes and say, Uncle, you got to teach me how to play golf. These guys are getting hired and, you know, and, and they, they're, getting, they're getting promoted past me because why? They're playing golf with the, you know, the, highest, the high, higher ups, the uh, people that decision makers. Mm -hmm. huh. I'll tell you, people will. Anyway. A okay. lot like, more to golf than we've been the, thinking the about. The game that started sure. in Scotland in 1457. And that was mine. That's long. a modern day. It was, it it was right. a similar game played long before that, but oh, that's really? modern day. Yeah. Nine, 920. Yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. 920. Mm -hmm. But the game as we know it, 1457. Scotland. That is Scotland. a very long time in Scotland. You mentioned being a caddy, and most people, I guess, even the novice golf fans are familiar with the Masters played in Augusta, mm -hmm. Georgia. Mm -hmm. And up until recently... They were all black caddies that used to work for the golfers. That's how they got their jobs, and that's how they got paid. And that was pretty much tradition. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the golfers wanted to bring their own caddies with them, and they had to slowly Matriculate. acquiesce yeah. Yeah. to that. Okay. Now, it cut out a lot of the black caddies and the black presence, but you can understand why a golfer would want to bring his or, own, his or her own caddy. Mm -hmm. with them. Your thoughts on that? It's big money. Yeah. Huge money. You figure, case in point, first prize is usually, you know, a million plus. Your majors are upwards of, this is first prize. First prize. Yeah. Upwards of two million. So a caddy gets maybe 5% of that. That's a good living. Now, is that up to the golfer how much he or she wants to pay the caddy, or is it kind of like an industry it's, standard? It's an inter industry standard. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But again, you're talking about some people are more generous than others, right. but uh, that's a standard. Yeah. And I was speaking of the Masters. I was fortunate enough to go to the Masters with a friend of mine, Quinn, in uh, 2009. And I want to tell you, it was an absolute wonderful experience because I'd given up the. Uh, the dream of ever going, but uh, he so fit that you know blessed me with that you know, that uh, experience, and it was absolutely wonderful. And you know, you can't find a blade of grass anywhere. I I spoke with the horticulturalist. He had seventeen on his staff 
alone. Wow. Let alone the regular maintenance crew. And then when you're setting up a big tournament like that, they have volunteers coming from all a lot, a lot of other golf courses to help out. And I'm, you're talking about pristine, bro. immaculate. Just for that one tournament. Masters, yeah. Those are your ma masters. Your major, major tournaments. You got you got your uh, uh, the masters, the U.S. Open, the PGA. Well, the PGA has moved before now, and then the uh, U.S. Open, and then the British Open, which they call the Open. You know? Right. Now, I want to the four major tournaments. What about the tournaments that I guess aren't major? Mm -hmm. About the payout in one of those. Or do you know? The first prize is probably nine hundred some thousand, you know, close to a million. First prize. <laughs> and they pay don't don't forget they pay seventy in ties now. So the last place might get eighteen thousand. I mean roughly. Huh. So they they you know, it's a purse distribution. Like I said, you wanna look at that, yeah. you know. And we'll we'll have, have those idea. numbers up for you on the graphics all later in the show. Mm -hmm. Again, this is Listen Up a Minute. I'm John Dow, along with my co-host, Dr. Burt Pope Matthews, and we are here with Carl Matthews. And again, that's just the breakdown of one tournament. I'd like to interrupt and yes. ask a question. So I'm sitting here thinking, golf wasn't really for me. <laughs> I've, I've, I've tried it, and I probably shouldn't have tried it because when putt putt wasn't for me, why would I? Why would I go out on the golf course? But I tried it, and I can see why people would be fascinated with the game. But again, it wasn't for me. But I'm hearing about how lucrative the game is for caddies. So I would just like our listening audience to know what exactly do caddies do? Well, caddies go out and they get yardages for the player so they'll uh, be make better decisions as to what club to um, use they carry the bags they um, it's like a, what do you call an aid they 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 there for the player mm -hmm. they'll uh, again they'll uh, prep everything for his competition mm -hmm. they get the balls set for him to play with they'll mark the balls They'll uh, tend the pin. They'll, you know, just uh, a lot of different things that they'll do. And uh, like I say, if it rains, then they have to keep the equipment dry. Um, just uh, get to the golf course before the player, get the yardages all down. Uh, just, just, uh, just a lot. So if we have someone in our listening audience who's interested in becoming a caddy, how would you suggest they go about that? Just briefly, what, what would be one or two steps that they would need to take? A lot of courses don't even have caddies anymore okay. because they okay. replaced them with the golf carts. Okay. But if you, you know, did, matter of fact, I'm hoping to maybe institute something like that again because mm -hmm. get some of these kids off the street, you know, and, and put a little money in their pocket and maybe develop a love for the game. I don't okay. know, but I'm just saying, again, that in... It goes into that possibility category we're talking about. Okay. Past, present, and possibilities, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, you mentioned you found your first club was a number seven something, and the caddy will help the golfer choose which club. Mm -hmm. Why is that important, say, a number seven as opposed to a number three, and whether it's a five-foot putt or 200-yard, whatever? What? Explain the difference. Good question. Good question. In a, in a stipulated round, you you well anytime you plan, you know, legally you can have up to fourteen clubs in a bag. Okay. And let's say um, if I have a hundred yards to negotiate, just hypothetically, I might hit a pitching wedge a hundred yards. So now my next club would be a nine iron you factor in 10 yard increments. So if I hit a pitching wedge 100 yards, I'm gonna hit that nine iron 110 yards. And it, you know, again, eight iron, 120 yards. If it's against the wind, then I'm clubbing up. I'm taking more club, a long, stronger club. If it's downwind, I'm taking less club, okay? If it's uphill, you know, and again, it's a game of um, 
adding and subtracting? Because, you know, like even, for example, when you have your pin placements on greens, the typical green may be 30, 32 yards deep. So half of that would be, you know, maybe 15, 16 yards. So you'll have a pin on the front, pin in the middle, pin in the back, a pin right, pin middle, pin left. And you're trying to shape your ball to get as close to that t intended target as you can. Yeah. So again, uh, just making good decisions on what club to hit because you know yardage is a, a precise out there, very precise. And the club makes a difference. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Right. Abs and it, it makes a difference into you know, as to the trajectory, okay. and again, how far you hit it. And you can, you know, uh, you know, maneuver that club to uh, make it go lower or higher. You know, and I, we don't want to get into all the you know, <laughs> mechanics of it because it, it'll blow your mind. So tell us, who was the most intriguing person you played with? Most intriguing? Or played against, yeah, the most intriguing. Well, I, I played with Smokey Robinson, nine holes at Makaha West, oh, wow. and I, I, I uh, showed him his first eagle. He had never seen an eagle until I made one. <laughs> um, I played golf with Johnny Mathis uh, three times, two times in Los Angeles, and one time in Hawaii. Uh, played for James Worthy, a basketball player, played with him his very first 18 holes of golf ever. Um, I got a pair of shoes from O.J. Simpson. Uh, one of our members, Herb Zukukorn, played with him in the Hawaiian Open, and uh, the, one of the you know uh, prizes that they gave him, or you know, it was a pair of shoes, and uh, their shoes were a little tight for him, so they uh, they gave them to me. I, I think I still have them in storage over in Hawaii now. <laughs> We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back with more of Carl Matthews, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about some golf and some other things. Poetry! Listen, listen up a minute. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back, and this is Listen Up a Minute, along with Dr. Burke Pope Matthews. I'm John Dowd, along with Carl Matthews. Golf Poet 2. And golf he said poet. someone had taken Golf Poet 1. Yeah, I was trying to do a <laughs> Skype with an ex-girlfriend of mine in Hawaii. And I you know, put in Golf Poet 1 and they said, sorry, that's been taken. So I said, I'm <laughs> Golf Poet 2. Golf Poet 2. Go so, to the next yeah, one. Right. Carl, yes. um, I've heard and I, I think I, I also read that you helped to train a very influential person in the field of golf. So would you share, I think you know who I'm talking about. Yes, that happened to be President Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. 1994. Uh, he played our golf course. And because my boss and uh, the general manager, they had left the island to play a different golf course, that kind of left me in charge. So I'm off that day, but we had went around and made sure everything was you know, okay, and I'm ready to go enjoy the rest of my day. And so I said, let me go out there and watch him play for a couple of holes. So I go out there and watch him play, uh, and catch up with him on number seven. And uh, one of the you know, guys that he was playing with said, uh, Carl, you know, why don't you want to give the president some tips, you know? So I was out there with him for like three and a half hours and took a lot of nice pictures. And he was, I mean, just, I, could, I can't say enough good things about him because he was awesome. very approachable. Awesome. And the kids had actually gone outside for, you know, there was a school adjacent to the golf course, number, uh, hole number three. And the kids were all surrounded the fence and stuff. And he went over there and kind of greeted them. And I'll never forget hole number 12 uh, Kit and John Rasmussen are members of ours, and they were out there waving the little American flag, and he went over and greeted them, man. And I'm gonna tell you, he just brought tears to my eyes, just just how how uh, approachable and how uh, mm -hmm. giving he was. I, mean, I can't say enough for him, and pretty decent golfer too. Okay. And I, I often kid him about it. I said, man, it seems like the uh, the uh, 
more people are around, the better quality <laughs> shots he hit. <laughs> and, the motivation. And huh? also, number 10, he made a real nice long, uh, about, probably about a 20, 23 footer, uh, right to left breaker. And he sunk, and we both high five. And I said, Oh, I'm not, this is the President of the United States. I'm, right. I'm, I'm high five. And, you know, and I caught that, myself. You know. mm -hmm. But, uh, and also, too, uh, he wanted. He took a lot of pictures with us, and, and my ex-girlfriend then at the time had gotten my then uh, eight-year-old son out of uh, school and brought him there, and he took a couple of pictures with us. And he wanted. And the, the girl ran out of film, and uh, he said, "We'll take some more later on." And so when he finished up 18, he said, Where you, "Where's your son? Where's your son?" I mean, I had forgotten all about that because you know people all over the place. But anyway, that's. That's that is it, so yeah. great. So for a man who actually helped to train one of the presidents of the United States in the game, please share with us what exactly do you think this game could do for youth? What kind of skills can it help to just instill in them? What I say, my theme is past, present, and possibilities. Mm -hmm. Those possibilities are endless. Endless. Because, again, when you have... Uh, a mentorship program, mm -hmm. a golf caddy program, a scholarship program, um, just just uh, getting the kids, you know, focused into something more constructed. Because again, one of my favorite quotes is where the attention goes, the energy flows. That's right. And so That's our right. kids, you know, they're good imitators, <laughs> but we have not shown them a good model. Hmm. Hmm. We have not shown them a good mm -hmm. model, and we need to be about our, our kids' business, you know. I want to get you to uh, read us one of your first oh, poems, okay. but before that... I thought um, you never real, real, real quickly, <laughs> President Clinton is left-handed, as am I now. Is that a different approach? He played right, right, right Oh, he oh, played right oh okay, yeah. well. Is it a different approach, right and left handed? You know, how you approach the game and make Just it on sharp? the opposite side. That's also, but same techniques, just opposite side. Again, you got to you gotta figure what level you're talking about okay. now. For the Beginning good player, okay. it's all going to be. <laughs> it doesn't matter. If you're talking about a high handicapper, you, you're just all across the board, you know, all <laughs> across the spectrum. But a good player, uh, systematically, going to do a lot of good things similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like I tell you, the most important part of the golf swing is this little area right between your feet, about 12 inches. You have to get that club face you know, squared, impact, and sustain. Mm -hmm. That's the most critical part of the golf swing. All this is cosmetics. Hmm. Yeah. Right. All that's cosmetics. And I couldn't I could look, I could look you know, from across. <laughs> I just I could look a few hundred yards away, and I can tell you a person's swing just by you know, uh, looking at it. Get but from here, they all better be twins. Because mm -hmm. you're talking about a pure ball striker. Versus a, a, a wannabe ball striker. Yeah, mm. I must have been a wannabe because I could <laughs> not get those three steps. Man. Okay, um, are we ready? Good, yes, sir. We're ready. This first poem I'm going to do is uh, reflections, and what I what I try to do since I've started sharing this is to have people you know close their eyes because I want them to go f on this journey. It's like a journey of our African American in these United States. Yeah. So listening and if you can audience, close your eyes, listening you audience, close, close your eyes okay. and take this journey. Reflections. Chained and shackled, the stench was so bad. I was forced to leave the loved ones that I once had. Packed like sardines for this long journey to a distant land. Beaten and whipped if you dare make a stand. Bought and sold to slave masters of the South. They took my name, my dignity. They also took my language from my mouth. Not allowed to read, write, or become educated. Boy, you have no need of these, my master stated. I helped build this country with blood, sweat, and tears. Even served in the military for a number of years. Followed around in your stores like a common thief. Jobs sent abroad, forced on welfare relief. Why do they behave the way that they do? Bomb beaten, dragged, and raped, you would too. Innocent till proven guilty, you say that's how it should be. This somehow does not apply to me. I drink your whiskey, I smoke your dope. Oops! Another generation up in smoke. Technology zooming, gene injection looming. 
I wonder where do I fit as this population keeps booming. Hmm. Reflection. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. That's pretty deep. And uh, I want to do this one. Uh, I titled it T I O N. And several times this has happened to me. You know, you wake up in the morning and uh, T I O N. Wow, you know, where does that come from? And usually about four days later, because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, so usually about four days later it'll come back again. T-I-O-N. Wow, where does that come from? And so then I had the uh, idea to look up the dictionary, words ending in T-I-O-N. And so I did. I came up with a list of words and I formulate this piece and just some observations. Overpopulation with people from other nations equals resentment and frustration for our future generations. Hesitation, lack of organization, no aspirations equals victimization. Non-participation, illiterate articulation equals non-appropriation. Exclusion, lack of certification, deceitful nomination equals limitation. Sadistic intervention, yielding to temptation, inferior arbitration equals incarceration. Rationalization for lack of compensation for our efforts in our nation, where is the justification? Compassionate opposition, frequent benediction, qualified representation equals liberation. Orientation of our population concerning society's destructive impact affecting globalization. Zonation, gravitation, polarization, opinionation, proliferation, starvation, and the effects on the mother nation. Certification for God's creation, beautification of his holy nation, in hopes of eternal salvation. T-I-O-N, tensions in our nation. Wow. Pretty good. Pretty Very good. good. Listen, we need to wrap this up. We wish okay. we could go on longer, but like the good doctor said, a good way to get youth involved in golf and not only having a seat at the table, but being a decision maker so they can get a slice of the pie, maybe help create the pie. Mm -hmm. And you said golf, golf is one way of doing it, but the other possibilities that can grow from golf. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the mission of the, the PGA Foundation. Okay. The mission is positively impact the lives of youth, military veterans, and diverse populations through the creation of utilization of golf programming that supports education, health and wellness, and youth development. It's a game for all. Excellent rehabilitation tool for dis disabled veterans. Improve and advance opportunities for youth. Promote family values, health and wellness, fitness, and leads to a productive citizenship driven by the beliefs we create and support golf programming for at-risk youth. Strive to make golf inclusive of people from all cultures and ethnic, ethnic backgrounds and for individuals with disabilities. And I'd like to close with, golfers are athletes and golf itself is explosive in nature. To hit the golf ball far, you must produce the maximum range of motion and force. Powerful golf performance begins with a strong, powerful body. Golfers of all levels don't realize the importance of having a fit, flexible, and toned body and how it translates to your golf swing, balance, mental focus, and every facet of your golf game and life. To me, golf is one of the most rewarding, enjoyable, and challenging of all leisure activities. It allows you to learn about yourself, to challenge yourself, to learn patience, discipline, decision-making skills, and how to perform under pressure. There's nothing quite like hitting a purely struck golf shot, a long drive, or sinking a long putt. 
A consistent daily routine not only helps improve your golf game, but you will have more energy, better focus, and lose weight. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we are so... I'm not, I'm not sure if that covers everything. <laughs> no. It covered it a covers lot. Enough. It covered a lot. And we're just so grateful that you joined with us this evening because I truly believe our listening audience has learned a lot. I know I have about the game of golf. And the last information you share with us as to how the PGA really impacts the lives of others in such positive ways, I don't think we knew that. I don't think people know that. I'd like so to, that's great. Oh, I'm sorry, I'd like to close with, you know, you have not because you ask not. There's 41 sections in the, in the PGA, 41 mm -hmm. section. This is the mid-Atlantic section. Mm -hmm. What if we ask those people to try to help implement some uh, programs in schools? Absolutely. And if you guys uh, want to look up Midnight Golf, mm -hmm. Midnight mm -hmm. Golf, it's not what it sounds like, mm -hmm. but it's a wonderful program that's uh, out there that uh, I, I would love to see it implemented at all of the schools, wow. at all of the schools. Great. Midnight Golf. Great. For Dr. Burke Pope Matthews, our guest Carl Matthews, I am John Dowell and this has been Listen Up A Minute. Thank you so much.